Welcome to Mentoring Slit Lamp Skills. This video will present steps to mentor a student who's performing a contact lens pre-fit slit lamp exam. Keys to performance include taking a patient history, understanding the types of illumination, following a step-by-step -step procedure, and documentation. To get the most out of your contact lens pre-fit exam, you must start with a patient history. This will alert you to previous diseases and injuries that may be visible during the exam. You must also know the capabilities of the instrument, knowing how to set up various types of direct and indirect illumination. If you always follow a step-by-step -step procedure, you are less likely to miss something. You should carefully document any concerns and discuss them with the doctor. Okay, Lucas, today we're going to go through the step-by-step -step procedure to do a pre-fit slit lamp exam. Okay. You know, and as you recall, the first step is always to focus the eyepieces. So we would take and put the focusing rod in there and turn the instrument on. Uh, take a look at one eye at a time. Turn it counterclockwise till it blurs and the back clockwise to have a nice sharp focus. Same thing for the other eye. And then with both eyes open, move it back and forth like a pair of binoculars until you have comfortable binocular vision. Okay. Then the next part is we need to position the patient. So we're going to remove the focusing rod. And I like to move the whole base of the instrument up and over so we're not blasting her in the eye. We're going to go ahead and take some alcohol. Wipe down the chin rest and the head rest. And the next step is to position the patient. So we want to have her, now she's a little taller, so we're going to bring the instrument table up a little bit. All right, chin in here, forehead right up against there. And what we're looking for is that her outer canthus aligns with this mark on the slit lamp. And you can see you got a mark on this side as well. So what would you think? She's a little bit low at this point? Yeah. All right, so we can use this black knob, a little extra alcohol. Uh, okay, go ahead and put your head back in there. And before we start that, we want to make sure that we have a moderate width beam. And we can control the width of the beam right here. And we want to use uh, one to two millimeters. We're going to leave it on the full vertical height rather than all the way down like this, right up at 14 millimeters. Uh, we make sure that the beam is straight up and down so that it's not rotated. And we're going to be using a direct focal illumination, meaning that the microscope and the light source are looking directly at what we're trying to observe. So we're going to come in and we're going to go through a sequence where we do the uh, lower lid margin, upper lid margin, lower palpebral and bulbar conjunctiva, the nasal bulbar, the upper bulbar, the temporal bulbar, and then we'll move on to the cornea. Okay. Now, as we look at her eye, we're going to divide it right down the middle. So anytime we're looking at something from the middle of her eye toward her ear, the light source is toward her ear. Anytime we're looking at anything from the middle of her eye toward her nose, we're going to be moving the light source over toward her nose. We want to move the instrument up. We want to have the light beam high enough so that it's over the lid margin, uh, across the lashes, across the lacrimal lake, and just a little bit up onto the bulbar conjunctiva. All right, so now, what you want to be able to do is be keeping things in focus and also in your head or out loud verbalizing uh, what conditions you should be looking for as we look at each of these structures. So for example, as I sweep the lower lid margin, you know, my expectation that you'd be able to tell me that, okay, now I'm sweeping the lower lid margin, I'm looking for signs of blepharitis, uh, plugged meibomian glands, uh, entropian, ectropian, uh, hordeolum, chalazians. And as I'm coming across, now our, our, our uh, lid margin is dipping down a little bit. So I'm s just slowly lowering the, uh, the beam a little bit with the control stick so that I don't uh, get the light in her pupil. Coming across, now I've reached the midpoint of her eye. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to move the light source to the nasal side and continue my sweep all the way to the inner canthus. When I get to the inner canthus, I'm going to raise the beam up so it's as high uh, on the upper lid as it was low on the lower lid. Again, the goal is to try and keep it out of her pupil until we have to uh, enter the pupil as we sweep the cornea. All right, so I'm coming back across the upper lid margin. Again, raising it as I go, keeping 
Now with the upper lid, the, the upper lashes are quite long, so you want to make sure that you're focused on the base of the lashes, not the tips. Okay. That's where all the stuff's going to be. We get to the midpoint, we move it back over the temporal side, come across, start lowering it back down. Okay, and now the next step is we want to look at the lower palpebral and lower bulbar conjunctiva. So to do that, the patient's going to need to look up and the key to pulling the lower lid down is getting on top of the lashes and pulling straight down using this part of your thumb right here. Okay. All right, so you got to reach around the light source, have her look up, go all the way up, pull the lid straight down, and as I do, you can see that I can see both the lower palpebral as well as the lower bulbar conjunctiva. As I sweep across, when I'm looking at the lower uh, palpebral, I'm looking to see how smooth it is, how much injection is there, to see if there's any kind of uh, conjunctival cyst. When I get to the midpoint, I want to move my light source over. I can regrip, look up. And I'm going to come all the way across. Now, on the ball bar, I might see things like uh, nevus, um, inconjunctival cyst, all the way to the inner canthus. Okay, now you can blink a few times for me. Now, the next area I want to look at is the nasal ball bar conjunctiva. And most of the time, I'm not going to have to manipulate her lids to be able to see that. Okay. I can simply raise the beam up, ask the patient to look over here for me, uh, a little higher, right there. Good. And I'm going to bring it into focus. I'm looking to see how much injection is there. Um, generally, it should be pretty white. Any blood vessels that are there should be pretty small. Now, as I get a little closer in this area here, what kind of things might I see in, in this area of the bulbar? Like a pinguecula? Exactly. Pinguaculas, pterygiums, things like that that might occur in that, that 3 and 9 o'clock position on the eye. And as I approach the limbus, I'm looking at the blood vessels to see, you know, it's not uncommon for the limbal vessels to be a little engorged, but what we're concerned about is any vessels that are penetrating into the cornea. We want to avoid that. Okay, and now I can just kind of sweep back and see if I missed anything on that sweep. All right, so now I want to look at the upper bulbar conjunctiva. So I'm going to use this part of my thumb. I'm going to get underneath her lashes. She looks down, and I'll push her upper lid up to the orbital rim. That'll give me a nice view of that upper bulbar conjunctiva. So you're looking straight ahead. I'm using this part of my thumb underneath the lashes. Look down. And now I've pretty much immobilized her upper lid. And again, I'm looking for signs of injection. I'm also paying attention right at 12 o'clock to make sure that there's you know, no signs of neovascularization. Flip the light source over. Continue across. Okay, now she can blink a few times. And again, on, on the temporal side, just like the nasal, I'm not going to have to manipulate her lids. I can simply direct her gaze all the way to your left, follow my finger, and I come in. And again, take a nice even sweep, looking for any uh, pinguaculas, pterygiums, nevi, conjunctival cyst, injection, all the way to the limbus. Okay, and then back out again. All right, so now we've done everything but what? We're going to do the circumcorneal reflection. The, the circumcorneal halo, halo right, yeah. uh, or sclerotic scatter. And remember, that's the one illumination that we don't necessarily need to use the microscope for. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look at the cornea. And the initial screening illumination would be sclerotic scatter. And for that, what we need to do is direct the beam of light directly at the temporal limbus. And if you come around here and watch, you'll see as I move that beam to her temporal limbus, you look on the nasal side, you see that halo? Oh, wow. Okay. And I can even use a little bit of a, you know indirect or retro uh, effect if I turn it. But no matter what I do, I need to have the beam directly at the temporal limbus. When I get it set up right, I'll get that circumcorneal halo. And when that happens, the light's bouncing back and forth between the epithelium and the endothelium all the way across. As I lean in, 
If there's any opacity, it's going to appear lighter against the dark background of that pupil or iris. You know, if I look in and everything looks clear, then that tells me that there's probably no significant scars or edema or problems with the cornea. I'm still going to do a detailed sweep, but it, it just alerts me to, to major problems that might be there. Okay. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and bring the microscope back in line. I'm going to make sure that I've got at least a 45 degree angle. I may want to bring the beam down a little bit. And really here, you're, you're going to focus to create a good parallel pipette. And uh, that looks pretty good there. And you'll, you'll notice that with the parallel pipette, we've got that moderate width beam. And we've got it set up correctly. You'll see two different zones. You'll see a, a zone where the, the particles are moving in the tiers. And then you'll see another uh, light gray zone, which represents an illuminated block of the corneal tissue. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and sweep it. And again, looking for scars. Um, um, if it was a follow-up visit, I might see vertical stree in the patient. Uh, some patients will have some endothelial pigment deposits. Yeah, but when I get to the midpoint, make sure I move the light source to the other side. Sharpen my focus so I can see those particles moving in the tears. Blink. It's always good to have them blink on a fairly regular basis so you can see what's stationary and what's, what's moving in the tears. Uh, it'll also give you a sense of the quality of their tears, too. The more debris that's floating in there, the you know, more problems you might have. Blink. All the way over to the inside. Coaching right. or that's scaffolding process. involves providing the, the mentee with verbal support of cognitive activities needed to perform a competency. Okay, well, why don't you try taking For this competency, the mentor would now allow the mentee to perform the slit lamp exam. The mentor will provide suggestions on techniques and clarify understanding. Exploration involves giving the mentee room to solve problems on their own. The mentor slowly withdraws some of their support and allows the mentee to perform the competency on their own. In this case, the mentee should be supervised closely prior to independently performing the exam. They will eventually be able to perform the competency on their own. Reflection is where the mentor encourages the mentee to review their performance on a competency. The mentee should think about what worked and what did not work. They should also consider what they need to do next to improve their performance. For example, the mentee is asked to reflect on the prefit exam that they just performed. All right, so you had a chance to do a, a full prefit slit lamp exam. Um, how'd you feel about that? Following reflection, the mentor needs to encourage the mentee to communicate their findings. As the mentee articulates their perception of their performance on a competency, the mentor can agree or provide additional suggestions. For example, in this case, the mentee should talk about why the prefit exam was difficult to perform. Was it their lack of experience in preparing and using the slit lamp? Was it because they did not follow the proper sequence in performing the exam? Was it due to the patient's unusual eye conditions? Well, good. The mentor will help the mentee identify areas they need to work on. Great in the future. Well, thank you. And thank you, patient. Thank you to Hillsborough Community College, the Opticianry Summit, the American Board of Opticianry, and the National Contact Lens Examiners for their support of this project.